<laughs> now recording. Okay, yeah, I see that. Okay, so um, this talk really neatly follows on from uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, Diego finished with at the sort of the end of his talk. Um, my main aim with this hour is to acknowledge the fact that um, apart from the very biggest of research projects, most researchers can't go out and hire designers. Um, so my aim is to give you a few little rules of thumb and little tips and tools to use that um, even if you think you're a terrible designer that you can improve a little bit. Uh, and so hopefully everyone's user interfaces get a little bit nicer to look at. Um, so yeah, hello, uh, my name is Mark Turner. And um, as already said, I head up the um, research software engineering team at Newcastle University. I've been doing that for uh, like three years. I've been leading that team, but I've been at Newcastle for nine years um, in various guises as a software engineer. Before that, I worked in industry as a web developer. Um, most of my background is in building things for the web um, in user experience design particularly. Um, but these days I do all manner of things. This is um, my little uh, sort of uh, pet area user experience. So within my team, we've got loads of software engineers, but I, I'm the one that likes to make things look better. Um, so I want to open with this uh, quote, which is actually originally a tweet from this guy, uh, Martin LeBlanc, who's the CEO of Icon Finder, uh, which is just a tool for finding icons, as you would imagine. Uh, but this uh, user interface is like a joke. If you have to explain it, it's not very good. Really gets to the heart of um, ways of thinking about what you're trying to achieve by building a GUI. Um, you're trying to, um, as much as possible, stop the user picking up the user manual, um, which they would obviously have to do if you were working through the command line, because they've got to learn all the commands. The ultimate nirvana is to try and get your user interface so intuitive and easy to use that it's almost impossible to use incorrectly. Now, that's uh, a pretty lofty goal, quite hard to do, um, but you should at least sort of set out with that intention. Um, so I'm gonna sort of cover four things in this uh, talk. Um, the first bit is really uh, what I'm calling first principles. And a lot of them, there's like a list of 10, and most of them you will have either heard of before or think they're so obvious that they need no introduction. Um, and most of them, because you all are programmers of one kind or another, um, they're not necessarily first principles for design, they're first principles in the ways of thinking about building stuff, including code. So a lot of them you will think, well, I do that already in the way that I code. So, um, but they're, they're useful things to keep in your mind while you're talking about GUIs and, and user interface design. The next bit is to um, uh, learn some of the, the powers of the different things that you can uh, leverage to affect the way users interact with your design. Um, this is like color and fonts and spacing and all that kind of stuff. Then I'll talk about some tools and techniques. So um, how to, um, like just practical things you can do and um, little tools that I've used in the past that I think are good and that would I would recommend. Um, and then we're going to have a bit of a laugh at the end where we look at um, uh, real world examples of uh, really good, uh, really bad and really ugly design um, because you can learn things from all three of those categories. Um, and I'll explain more when we get there. Uh, so first principles. So like I said, these are about um, keeping certain little rules in your head, um, no matter how obvious they are, so that you don't lose sight of what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, and one of these rules is effectively about not reinventing the wheel. I forget which number it is. Um, but in the spirit of not reinventing the wheel, I should say that I, I didn't come up with these list of 10. Um, I first saw them in 2015 um, at a conference in Gateshead called uh, Thinking Digital, which is a fantastic conference. You should all look it up and go. Um, and it was a talk from uh, these two guys, Russell Davies and uh, Ade, Ade Wumney. Um, and they were working for the government digital service at the time. Um, and this is the rarest of examples of when a UK government um, is unusually competent and does something well. Um, so they, um, 
I forget who which minister it was that spearheaded this campaign, but basically they they broke the mold when it comes to civil servants and up their salaries for um, both the designers and coders to come in and completely overhaul um, the way that the government did things digitally, especially for um, the public. So a lot of you will have interacted at some point over the last few years with the uh, gov.uk website and uh, all the stuff that you can apply for and do there. Um, that whole process was completely done with a mixture of um, new hires within the government and external services to, to completely rebuild that whole thing. Um, the One of the most interesting anecdotes from the talk that they gave was that if you imagine everything the government does online, so um, this is applying for passports, driving licenses, um, like filing your taxes, like it's just a huge, if you imagine that as an application, and all the features it has to have, it's ginormous. And you've got the added complexity that it is for literally everyone in the UK is your user base. Um, the, you would struggle to think, where, where do you even start with a project like that? Like, how do you wrestle the pieces apart? Um, what they did was um, interrogate all the existing services, ranked them by number of users, and started with the biggest ones first. So uh, things near the top of that list would be um, the tax system, the uh, benefits system, anyone using those. Um, and then it would be things like passports and driving licenses that have millions of users. Um, they opened the champagne to say that the job was finished when the last service was fully uh, digitized and went online. That last service was the portal for applying for a license to be buried at sea. That is the least used government service in 2015. So without further ado, uh, number one, start with user needs. Again, this goes back to some of the things Diego was saying. Um, you can't, um, you've got to remove yourself from the list of users because you're biased, like Diego said. Um, and you need to start by thinking uh, about what your users need. And if you don't know, you've got to ask them. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to um, build the right thing. You've also got to be mindful, though, about a little bit of psychology here because sometimes users don't know what they want or, or they uh, don't know what they don't want. Um, you've got to uh, think carefully about how you extract that information from people. Um, that's a whole talk in itself. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, but if you're interested in sort of user psychology, um, there's loads of material online about that. Uh, do less. So this is basically don't reinvent the wheel. Um, don't start from scratch all the time. Build upon what other people have done, be that um, utilizing web frameworks like Bootstrap, that kind of thing. Um, you don't need to do everything from scratch. No one these days, if you're talking about web development, opens like a text editor like Notepad and starts typing HTML tags. It's all about um, um, like toolkits and frameworks to, to speed things up. Uh, design with data. So um, there's loads of examples of things gone wrong on the internet where people start building applications with um, like test data that they've generated themselves, then they deploy it and then they expose it to real data and everything breaks uh, just because they've not um, factored that in. Um, so you need to both design with data that's going to be shown visually in your, your GUI, but also um, instrument up your application so that you're constantly getting feedback about how people are using your GUI. Um, and let that data drive your uh, decision making. And that can be done throughout. So um, typically at Newcastle, we would build that kind of thing in from the start. So the most basic example would be something like Google Analytics or um, that kind of thing, where we just put it in from the beginning before we even show users so that once we do start showing users, you're getting that steady stream of data. Uh, do the hard work to make it simple. So this really is a mentality thing. Um, it's about uh, not accepting the, well, it's always been that way or that'll do type mentality. Um, it's about um, taking the time to, to do it properly and not let yourself fall into that trap of being lazy, basically. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one, um, but it's important to do. Uh, iterate and iterate again. So this is basically... Um, uh, agile, right? It, so many of you might use these types of um, ways of thinking about the world when you code. Um, so short sprints, small amounts of changes between versions, um, frequently showing your GUI to end users. So um, 
your gap between version one and version two shouldn't be like a complete rewrite. It should be like uh, you've made something, you show it to your user, you get feedback, you implement bits of those feedback and show them again. Um, and you just go around that loop over and over and over again. Um, the small increments reduces the risk, it reduces big failures. Um, and it, when you do fail, it turns it into lessons, which is it's quite a nice way of learning, I think. Um, this one is um, because it's on the government list. When they say this is for everyone, they really do mean this is for everyone. I think for research software, that's, uh, I mean, some of the things you guys will be writing is about as niche as it gets when it comes to, to software packages and GUIs. Um, but every so often you will work on a project that is is big and has a potential large amount of, of end users. Um, and so you really do have to think about all of the different types of users you might encounter. Um, it, it touches on things like color blindness and um, different language and, and cultural uh, sort of backgrounds of your users. Um, so you, if you're the government, that one's a that one's a big one, but it can mainly be sort of it's less important or ignored if, if you're working in research software sometimes. Um, understanding context. This is really important because you can't always control it. Um, but then in research context, sometimes you can. Like uh, so the what we mean by context is um, what is the user doing when they're interacting with your GUI? What's going on um, around them? So uh, a classic thing to think about this would be, are they interacting with your app through their phone? In which case, are they um, out and about in a busy place? Um, so for example, we'll have worked on applications at Newcastle where we've deployed them into museums uh, to be used on sort of touch screens by an exhibit. That is a completely different set of contexts that your user is in because they could be in a crowded space with screaming kids versus sitting down at their desk in a university interacting with something that's running on a HPC machine. Um, context is really important because it completely changes the priority of uh, a flow through, through your application. Um, next. Um, so this again, is sort of touches on um, not reinventing the wheel, but it's about um, well, building services, not websites. So don't just build things in isolation as like um, monoliths or standalone applications. Think about the interconnectivity of research software these days, like the way that um, people will use uh, some of the Python packages or uh, uh, Jupyter Hub and that kind of thing, and Jupyter Notebooks. Um, if you know where, that most of your users are using tools like that, like meet them where they are, build things that plug into those systems. Don't just say, well, um, I'm building my app and there's a closed wall around it and you can use it, but you've got to use my ecosystem. Think about all of the other ecosystems that are out there that are popular and try and build bridges between what you're doing and what's going on in those areas um, to help your users move free between different services. Um, be consistent, not uniform. So this is about um, sort of rules of thumb when it comes to things like layout uh, and where you position your navigation and um, buttons and the way that things are expected to work in your application, but not being so rigid that um, you tie yourself in knots. So um, sometimes there will be edge cases in your application or certain screens that you think, you know what, I've got my navigation here in every other screen, but because of what's going on on this screen, I, it doesn't really work and it doesn't fit. Um, don't be afraid to, to, in circumstances, change the rules of your application, but it is being about consistent. So one thing I wouldn't do is like on every screen, change the color of certain buttons. You can move where the buttons are placed, but the button should always be blue, for example. Like it's consistent look and feel, but don't be too rigid. Um, and then, yeah, shout out to open source, basically. So um, make things open, make things better. I think most people will probably be of an open source mindset in, in research software. Um, and it's all the usual good stuff that open source has, the um, spotting problems quicker, sharing of code, designs, ideas, intentions, um, all that kind of thing is helped by um, coalescing around popular open source um, projects. Okay, so uh, the next bit is really about um, just knowing your medium. So um, 
you've decided you want to build a GUI um, and you've got some idea about what it needs to do, the functions it needs to have, but this is about how you realize that intention, how the, the tools at your disposal to, um, to help your user interact with what it is you want them to do. Uh, the first thing is um, to lay things out in grids. Um, this goes, especially on the web, there's a couple of people on the call who were web developers, but um, the reason grids work so well on the modern web um, is that you can't these days assume a certain screen size or device. Um, and this now goes for desktop as well. So there's mention of things like Electron. Um, it used to be that with a reasonable degree of accuracy, you could predict what sort of uh, size monitor people had on their desk. Um, that is now completely uh, out the window. You can't account for what people have. Uh, for example, I'm sat here with a huge sort of TV as my display. Uh, other people have much smaller sort of um, like uh, notebook type things. Um, what grids allow you to do is if you use frameworks for them, um, they will handle that responsiveness for you. So you don't talk in terms of pixels, you talk in terms of uh, percentage widths of the display. And then you have rules that collapse the number of grids and rearrange them um, to fit on smaller devices. Um, most of you will have seen this on the mobile web where you'll go to um, a site like the BBC and it's laid out one way on your desktop, you go to the same site on your phone and it rearranges everything. That's done completely dynamically and it's done using frameworks that work as grids. Um, you'll also find examples of websites that are just sort of really jarring to look at because stuff's just almost like spread around the screen. Um, and that's an example of where things aren't laid out in grids. Um, and sometimes you don't sort of intuitively see that. You just sort of get this jarring sort of, oh, that isn't pleasant to look at, but you can't really put your finger on why. Um, so basically the takeaway from this one is just always work in grids. If you think in that way, it's almost like uh, when Neo sees the matrix in code. When you look at a, a GUI, um, you start to see, right, well, that's like half the screen, that's the other half, and then the next layer down is like eight columns, that kind of thing. Um, negative space. So um, there's a lot of people will just start throwing um, components onto the screen, be that like a so let's imagine it's a form that a user has to fill in like this, um, and they'll just throw the text boxes on there with a button at the end that says submit and some instructions at the top maybe. The, the difference between um, something that's a bit nicer to look at when it's a form and it guides the user a little bit better is often the spacing between the elements. So it's, it's a sort of less is more type mentality of um, rather than using color and text to delineate things, just spacing things out um, sort of subconsciously lets the user know that there are things are grouped together. So in this example here, you've got the at the bottom, you've got the label and placeholder um, text for uh, text input, and you can see logically they're grouped together. And the reason that they appear like that is because on that column on the right there where you've got the red highlighted, there's padding and margins have been put on the labels and the, the groupings to space things out so that um, in your mind, it, logically, they sit together. And you can see the example of uh, at the top as well, the, how spacing the text out um, just makes things a bit easier to read. The one on the right is quite cluttered and the one on the, the left, uh, sorry, the one on the left is cluttered, the one on the right is a little bit easier to, to contend with. And, and all the designer has done there is add a little bit of padding. Um, it's it's really it, it it's not um, it's not rocket science, but um, you'd be amazed how many people sort of forget these things. Um, when it comes to text, um, users will think in terms of um, hierarchies. So um, you'll see this a lot when you're working with code and um, you're writing a markdown file for your README in GitHub. Um, there's a reason you use like uh, header one, header two, header three tags. It's so that the, the user can wrap their head around, right, the, these paragraphs sit together and are contextually similar because they're under this heading tag. And then when, you, when the user encounters the next header tag, they know it's the next section. If you just make all of your text the same font size and put it all on the screen, your user will treat it like a novel, like it's just 
pages of text and it's meant to be read together. Um, so a combination of um, different header sizes and white space means that you can logically divide up um, text in an application. So you've got this idea of like larger text means something that's more important. It's the introduction to a section, it's, it's the header. Your standard copy should be your medium text size and smallest for supplemental info. So usually that will be little um, uh, sort of one sentence help text in a form that kind of thing. So where you'll see um, maybe um, a password input and the, the password input rules will be in small text underneath the text input. So it'll say something like must have uh, uh, numbers and characters and special characters or something like that almost be like eight digits long or whatever. Um, helping to read. Okay, so um, especially on quite bright displays, um, black like uh, contrast can be really quite jarring to a user. So in this example here, um, I put uh, full black text on a full white background. Uh, but that's quite rare. Like when you go to websites, you probably won't notice, um, but they actually do like I put at the bottom, which is almost black. So it's like really dark gray on a, um, a really light gray, which is like almost white. Um, and this is done deliberately because it's just a little bit more restful on your eyes. Um, you can do this with any color. Um, I put black and white there because most text is like that, but even with the more modern things where you've got um, dark mode, it's just inverting these. So it's like almost white on almost black. Um, the Even when you use other colors like, um, like a red on, um, on a gray or something like that, um, it's about not going to the extremes of the color values for like, you don't want like the, the purest red on the purest black, um, soften the tones of your two colors and it reduces the contrast and it just makes things so much easier to read for your users. Um, color is super powerful, um, so use it sparingly. Um, but the reason for that is it can complete, like before a user even clicks on anything, it can completely change your user's expectation of what that thing does. Um, so the classic example here is Moon and Death Star, two objects that are th the same shape, but because of the way they're colored, like if I were to show you one, then the other, most of you go, oh, yeah, that's the moon, or yeah, that's the Death Star. All that's changed there is the color. And it just shows you the, 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 the importance of, of how you can manipulate your users through your choice of colors, um, because it will change the expectations of the user of when they click on something, what's gonna happen. Um, and the reason for that is, primarily uh, cultural. So um, you've got things like um, in the West, a color like red is uh, has multiple different meanings and it can be um, both passionate or aggressive. So it could be, uh, we would associate red with things like um, Valentine's Day and red love hearts and that kind of thing. But it can also mean danger or warning. Um, so there's a reason our stop signs are red, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but in the Far East, red is, is a positive color. It's about happiness, prosperity, good fortune, that kind of thing. So understanding your user base and where they're coming from and the cultural context they sit in is, uh, can, can be really important. Um, Another part of context is understanding the device that they're on um, and how they're going to interact with your application. Are they using a keyboard and mouse? Is it a touch screen? Is it some other form of input like um, uh, some sort of joystick or game controller or, you know? Um, the a classic example of this is the um, more recent change to move website navigation um, is typically on a, on a web browser on your desktop, either at the top of a web page or in one of the sidebars, something like that. On mobile, that doesn't work because you're holding the device and your thumb can't reach the top of the screen very easily. So typically web navigation is actually at the bottom of the screen as an overlay. Um, and that's purely about being context aware. The developer of those sites, of those mobile sites, know that they're on a phone 
And so they're accounting for the fact that um, their users can only reach so far. Um, so it's important to think about that kind of thing. Um, good assumption. So sometimes um, you know exactly what the user is trying to achieve. This is an example from um, the uh, FinTech startup bank Monzo. Um, and this is their screen flow for uh, verifying your identity when you open an account. So at this point, the developer of the Monzo app knows that the user is trying to open an account, right? So they're in a, um, what would be called a, like a focus mode where they're, they're trying to perform one task and that is open the account. Um, you'll notice that they've stripped away all of the navigation from their app. There's a, a back button to get back to sort of the Monzo home screen. But because you're in that focus mode, you want to make things as simple as possible for the user to achieve that task. Um, this goes back to one of the, um, um, the rules of thumb at the start about um, doing the hard, way, hard work to make it appear simple. Like when you look at these screens, you think, oh yeah, that's obvious, but it really isn't. It, it takes a lot, of, um, a lot of work and a lot of um, investigation with your users to figure out that this is the best flow, that this is the best thing to do for the user. Uh, so you're guiding them through this three-stage process and they only have to do um, a couple of things, which is basically take a photo of your driving license or a passport and then upload a short video to sit with your name so that they can um, verify your identity. The key thing as well as the, those two tasks, the video and the passport picture, is that they're guiding you through each step. They tell you ahead of time what you're gonna need, what, what documents you need, and they um, tell you at the very start what's gonna happen and why they're doing it, why they're asking for those things. Um, so really, um, for, a, for something that's a bank, where you're not going into a branch and there's not that implicit trust of, well, I'm in a branch of HSBC and I'm talking to a real human, trying to build that trust to talk about finance through an app is quite hard. Um, so the user experience here is a really great example of how they've achieved that. Okay, so some uh, tools and techniques. So given all of that stuff about color and fonts and um, like laying things out um, and talking to your users, that kind of thing, uh, some tips for how I achieve that basically. Um, first is to rethink really hard about your value proposition, which goes back to what Diego was saying at the very start about does your app even need a GUI? Um, if you come down on the side of yes, it does, there's probably a good reason you've answered yes to that question, which is there's some interaction or some function that you feel that your users need uh, a GUI to complete. Um, and that gets the heart of a value proposition. So you want your UI to answer the question, uh, what problem does my, uh, I, my users trying to solve? Um, users don't think in terms of the code, they're not thinking about novel features or cool little gimmicks users have problems and they're trying to solve them. And if you think in that way, how do I solve my users' problems? Um, your app will become, your, your GUI will become a lot clearer. And so yeah, the, the value solution to your user is the answer to a problem. That's how to think of it. Um, in terms of extracting some value from your users, in terms of trying to get some requirements and that kind of thing, um, often a first place to start is to just go and ask them. Uh, just get out there, interview some potential end users and, and talk to them. Um, the problem with that though, is that it doesn't really scale. So we'll get onto that um, in the next slide, but um, trying to identify what problems are trying to be solved, um, talk in terms of um, other apps that they might have seen that you can um, so sometimes users will say things like, um, uh, I'm using X and it works really well, but it just doesn't quite do Y. Um, so you can usually jump off from a certain point without um, having to sort of reinvent the wheel. And you should do this throughout the process. So like do it at the start when you're first interacting with users, show them early versions, um, continually get feedback even if after you've done a release, start thinking about the next release uh, and, and get more feature requests and feedback. Um, 
you can crowdsource input from users through um, things like surveys. That's um, a little less personal. I'd argue an interview is a really good place to start. But like I said, it doesn't scale. At some point, you're just going to have to go for like a survey type thing. Um, and a good thing to do is to um, bake analytics into your application so that you can verify that what your users are telling you is actually true because um, people lie all the time, uh, both like consciously and subconsciously. Um, and they may say things aren't working or that they don't like something, but then if you've got the sort of uh, click data to back up a, a contrary view, um, it's useful to have both. You want like real world human input and analytic input. Uh, journey maps. So this is a, a useful way of thinking about different um, aspects of your GUI because um, often users are trying to solve these problems and um, a problem can be made up of multiple tasks that a user has to perform. Um, and so a journey is really just a stitching together of several tasks. That's the way to think of it. Um, and it will help you draw out your GUI in wireframes because you can think um, uh, well, I'll use the Monzo thing. So um, users trying to open an account, that's the journey. They've got to perform a bunch of tasks. One is to open the app. The next is to provide a, a picture of their passport or driving license and then a video of them. Um, so the, each of those is an individual task and you stitch them together and that can form the basis of your navigation. And that cluster of tasks, that journey of opening an account fits inside an application that does a lot more than just open accounts. Um, it does a whole bunch of stuff, um, but it will help you logically separate aspects of your GUI into these components. Um, and as you're doing these tasks, you need to communicate throughout so that, um, like we saw with the Monzo app, they're telling you ahead of time what you need to provide, what's going to happen, uh, and then you get guided through the whole process. That's a really great example of how to communicate with your users throughout a user journey. Um, user testing. So this is where things start to scale and you leave interviews behind because you just can't do enough of them because there are too many users. Um, they'll, uh, you start playing around with different types of user testing. Um, this could be surveys, like I said, to capture and put. Um, it could be A-B testing, which is where you develop a feature in two different ways. If you can't quite decide which way is best, you make a, a version of each and show it to different um, cohorts of users and get feedback, which can be both surveyed feedback or it could be the analytics of click data from sort of uh, Google Analytics or something like that. Um, and you can decide right that way it works best. So it's basically like treating your user base like lab rats and um, big companies like Twitter and Facebook do this all the time. They will change um, like the position of different things on the screen and see which one is sort of um, almost more addictive, which keeps you there longer. Um, and they'll try that on two different cohorts of users and then they'll go with the one that keeps you there the longer because they're a social media company. Um, but it's really the combination, the user testing thing is a combination of like real user input and your analytics. Okay, so uh, wireframe. So this is um, it's where we start getting into some tools rather than just sort of concepts. Um, wireframes, um, is really the, the single most time-saving thing you can do when it comes to GUIs. So I, I know Diego is going to touch on this a lot later in the in the workshop. Um, but the sitting down and learning to draw again on paper or a whiteboard and not use your keyboard and mouse um, can really hone your focus as to what it is you're putting together and how it works. Um, so I would really recommend. Uh, there's loads of tools like all these balsamic mockups and wireframes, um, and I would recommend them all. I've used them all in the past. They are good, um, and they're useful for um, uh, sort of sharing your wireframes with potential end users or other people in your team saying, like, this is what we're building. Um, but what I would say is that you should really do your first wireframe drafts on paper because it just gets you to think a lot harder and then basically redraw them in one of these tools before you share them. Um, uh, so why wireframes? I think 
it can really help you make sense of the list of requirements. So you get these user journeys that stitch together. So they're different components in your application. Um, and it helps you conceptualize how they all fit together. So it's like a big jigsaw piece. So your navigation ultimately becomes a list of the high level features that your application has. Um, and then you can drill down to um, the different requirements of each of those areas, right? So um, drawing out like this example where uh, you click on a button, it takes you to a certain screen, there's a sign in, the search, um, drawing what happens when you click on certain buttons or certain elements in your GUI that then take you to other screens will really help you find bottlenecks in your design. Because if everything's flowing through one point or it's really hard to get to, um, let, let's say there's a, an aspect of your application that you think is quite important, but the user's got to click on four different things to get there, then that's an example of like, um, a really stretched out flow that's not quite right. So then you, you, you're you going to spot that on paper much faster than you would if you coded the whole solution up from your head, then gave it to a user, and then the feedback you got was it's too hard to get to that screen. You've wasted all that time. Um, so drawing saves you a lot of time. Um, after you've done the first, those first wireframes and um, you've been drawing, the next stage is sort of um, rapid prototyping. So there's a bunch of these tools that have um, emerged over the last few years. Those ones at the bottom I would recommend. Um, I'm a particular fan of Adobe XD, but then you need a, an Adobe license and that is quite expensive, but uh, Figma and Sketch are, are great. Um, these basically take your wireframes and add the beginnings of your graphical elements, like the color, the font, the style of the buttons, just the, the sort of um, the aesthetic of your application and add a little bit of interaction. So you can design individual screens and have it so that your user can click on buttons and take you, take them to the next screen. It's not proper interaction because they can't necessarily type inputs into forms and have things happen because you need code for that. Um, but it lets them sort of browse the application um, as a set of images um, so they can get a feel for how you would use it. So it's quite handy, uh, quite a good thing to do. Uh, so this is an example of um, a screenshot from Adobe XD. So you can see here in the top left, it looks like this is an example app for sort of um, wanting to go to a restaurant and then getting there um, through a bunch of other third party services. So the idea here is that um, the person's looking for a sushi place has found one um, and is they've got that select option there where it's a 15 minute drive um, up to 25 minute ride share or 30 minute by public transport and they've clicked on the ride share option and then it shuffles the, the bottom navigation up to show them taxi ride or auto m they've chosen ridey and call and then they'll hit call ridey so none of that is is real it's just a bunch of um buttons on the screen that when you click them take you from one screen to the next but it allows the end user to to really get a feel for how the application works with you writing absolutely zero code um, so it's another good time saving investment uh, color palettes this is um, a lot of people think well how do you know the colors that go like it's a fashion thing it's something that people often struggle with but there's so many tools out there and um, what i would say is color completely transcends user interface design. Um, if you think of things like the Pantone color of the year, and when you walk into a DIY shop and they've got all the, um, uh, the paint swatches out for whatever's in fashion at the moment in terms of interior design, um, don't be afraid to steal from the real world, from nature. Like if you want your application to be sort of uh, palettes of greens and browns, that kind of thing, um, Inspiration for what color you want your application to be is everywhere. Um, don't limit yourself to, to just saying, right, it's got to be blue. Um, be a bit more creative. To help you with that, there are these tools at the bottom. There's uh, coolers, which is really, really nice. I like that. Um, it just presents you with a um, five columns on a web page, and you just keep hitting spacebar until you find a, a palette that you like. And then you can lock individual ones of those five and just keep shuffling it. So it's just basically shuffles loads of colors as a, a palette that would go together uh, until you find one that you like. Color Mind is um, um, an AI based tool that relies on um, like a few uh, research into 
human psychology as to what colors go, but you start with a particular color that you like, and then it will generate a palette from that color of uh, complementary colors that will fit nicely together. Um, Adobe Colors basically does the same thing. Uh, font libraries. So it used to be in the old days of web development, you um, all websites look the same because you had to use the same set of what were called uh, web safe fonts. So this is things like Arial and Times New Roman um, that you could rely on being installed on every machine, no matter the operating system. Uh, these days, that is an irrelevance because you can install your own fonts and um, into, like baked into your application so that no matter what um, operating system your user is viewing your application on, um, it will look right. It will look as you intended it. Um, and so you can find fonts for free on uh, Google Fonts and Font Squirrel and a whole bunch of others. Um, I've added the Icon Finder one in there as well because particularly on the web, the modern way of doing um, small icons is to use icon fonts um, and then use SVGs as well for larger things like logos. But um, they're all good places to start. But there are so many websites for particularly icons, but also fonts um, that you can really just go out and find those yourself. You can um, you basically download them and install them on you, onto your machine so that even if you're building things for the desktop, um, you can still use fonts that you find on Google Fonts, for example. Uh, what I was going to say about fonts. Mm, no. Okay, so uh, a big thing that I think um, people who don't do a lot of designing um, will ask is like, how how do you do it? How do you put stuff together? How do you start from a blank page and just think, right, I'm going to make this now? Um, and it's really um, the, the sort of dark secret of it is just to be inspired by others. Like if I'm starting a, a new project and I, I want a new user interface, yes, I've got my wireframes and I've got an idea of like the elements that I need on the page. But in terms of the aesthetic of how I want it to look, I usually rely on being inspired by something else. Um, and I do that by just like looking around, looking at web. Every time I find a new website that I'm interacting with for some reason, uh, be that because I'm trying to use the thing or just because I've stumbled across it. If it's got some element to it that I really like, I sort of make a note of it and remember it for later to sort of come back and look at how it is put together so that I can steal it and use it myself in, in some, other, some other application. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, nine. Um, uh, examples of what I think is, uh, well, there's three from each, three good, three bad, and three ugly. My categorization for this is uh, that good is an application that is both easy to use and um, aesthetically looks good. Bad is something that um, might look good, but is just a real horror show of user experience, and ugly just fails across the board. Like it's really bad to use and it's hideous to look at. Um, at the end of this, I'm sure I will see in the chat other, uh, other people pitch in with things that they've seen that are good, bad, or ugly, and I would welcome them because I'm always on the lookout. Um, what I would say about the particularly the bad and the ugly ones is this isn't um, a critique on the individuals who built them. Like, I'm not here to poke fun and make mean comments about people. It's about um, when I show you them, you'll see, oh, that, that's not very good. But you don't just want to focus on the that's bad move on it's about what why is it bad like of all of the things i've shown you earlier in the talk about the rules of thumb and the, the different ways to use color and spacing and all the rest of it and the grid um identifying which of those sort of rules of thumb have been broken as to why it's a bad bad website so uh first up we'll start with the good um so this is obviously airbnb and the reason I like this, and I think it's a good example, is that um, just to appreciate the amount of information that the user is being shown without actually having to open up any other pages. Like on this one page, you've got the sort of where am I looking, the dates, the number of guests. You've got the column that you can scroll with the accommodation. Having everything on a map, you've got the prices. That's an awful lot of information to throw at your user in one go, but I never feel confused or scared of what's going on 
like it, it's um it's really a, a master stroke in user experience in terms of getting across everything the user needs is at their fingertips um but it's still really easy um even with things like the price like yes this is in a model so it's not on on display but having this histogram here is just absolutely inspired because i could just not have this histogram right and just say min and max price but how do i if, if i'm traveling somewhere by it's sort of obvious that I don't know that area because I'm going on holiday. So how would I know what the going rate is? So having the histogram there is just a, a brilliant, brilliant touch. Um, so yeah, Airbnb is awesome. Uh, this one um, is uh, Street View Treks, and this is about climbing El Cap in Yosemite. Um, the reason I love this one is that it's an absolutely superb example of um, understanding user context because they know on this site that the user it's a desktop site and uh, it means that they're either going to be on um, like a touch screen or they're going to have a mouse and they can make a scrolling gesture um, so it's really subverting the the way that the mouse works so as i scroll up here uh, i'm effectively doing the climb you can see the line move at the very bottom there and as i start the um, there's various points on the climb. So the first one is the starting point, the base of El Cap. So you're preparing your gear, you can explore, you can see what other things are going on. And there's little links off to do other things. I, I've got the height up the wall here on the right hand side. I can keep scrolling. A blue line emerges until I reach the next key point, which is here, first pitch. It's just a really unusual and novel way of um, having the user take a journey with just a mouse. Um, it's, I think it's really, really clever. Uh, this, this is the government website, so um, on the face of it, it may look um, quite bland and boring, but that's deliberate because, like I said, they're end users of the entire country. I think um, that this website has won countless awards for user experience. If you think about all of the users that has to be simple for, people who um, are elderly, who have various um, sort of... Uh, visual disabilities or whatever, like um, for a site to be effective, it has to be useful to the most number of users. And the government UK website is just uh, brilliant at this. You could not have any of these things and just have a search and just like search for what I'm looking for, like um, new passport, something like that. But they've also listed the most common areas that people go into so that if people are a bit up, um put off by the search aspect they can just start clicking in and they will ultimately find what they um what they need um but yeah it's um it's a, a a brilliant example of how user experience for the mass market is is done right so uh on some bad ones so these this isn't um this isn't terrible like this isn't i mean it's a bit boring sure but it's not like a really ugly website. The thing that's surprising about it is that this is Berkshire Hathaway. And some of you might know this company. Um, the CEO is Warren Buffett, um, one of the uh, richest people in the world. And this is their corporate website. Uh, I, there's a bit of mystique around Warren Buffett, like him living in a, a semi-detached house, I think somewhere he just drives a car that's like 20 years old or whatever. So he's not particularly showy. And I think the website basically captures that. But it's just a bit there's, there's nothing here. There's no navigation. There's nothing split into sections. It's just a list of links. Like in terms of if, if I'm trying to find something out about this company, I'm left to wander and explore by myself. There's nothing to hold my hand to guide me to what it is I'm looking for. Um, so yes, not aesthetically hideous. I mean, yes, it's boring, but it, it doesn't really do anything to help the user. It's just a splat. There's a bunch of information. Next one is uh, ah, WhatsApp, uh, the, the way that WhatsApp lets you delete messages for everyone. So um, the number of falling outs and fights this must have caused uh, between people who, it just look, it, it makes you as a user who's deleted a message look nefarious, like you're up to no good. Like I could have just made a spelling mistake and wanted to delete the message. Uh, but if I do that to the, to the other person in the chat, they think, hang on a minute, what have you done there? Like, was that message meant for me? Are you trying to hide something? It's just, um, 
it's not it's not nice it's not a good thing um equally I, it's easy for me to sit here and say this right that it's rubbish um but i should also hold my hand up and say i don't really know what else they could do uh, to make that better other than completely remove it and not have that message um but it's yeah that's a, a tough nut to crack next one is uh netflix um which i'm gonna have to show you my personal Netflix, and that right there, the audio that you can hear is the reason this is bad, because also playing video is one thing, but also playing uh, video with audio as well is just really jarring. The other fact is, like, if you see where I position my mouse, like, I know that that's a safe space uh, on the Netflix list. If I uh, move my mouse anywhere else, like, I then get the video and the audio. And it's just, if I'm just scrolling through, it's really off-putting and distracting. But I would say that Netflix have probably done their homework, right? They know that, uh, that there must be some reason they've done this, that they're in that realm of Twitter and Facebook where they'll do huge volumes of user testing um, and will know that this setup keeps people on their site. Um, I just don't really understand the psychology of that. Okay, so some ugly ones. So um, at first glance, you think, okay, well, this is just a website that hasn't been updated in ages and it's from like 1997 or whatever. Uh, I would point out the copyright 2021 um, and the latest updates, uh, they were adding Rex in November last year. So um, it's just, it's a list of links. There's harsh text, it's the, the bright blue is not, very nice to look at why having the word press written on a button um, is not great because your button should be obvious that it's clickable and this sort of are obvious. You'd, I'd argue you don't need the, the word press. What I would do to make this site better um, just in a user experience perspective is to change the word press for icons or something like that that describe what was in each of these sections, which they've tried to do with by having text next to them. Um, the blue water thing, I don't really understand why that's under the uh, text here, but you've got, yes, you can still read it because it's dark blue, but it's like dark blue on light blue. It's not great. Um, the search is hidden away down here. These are clickable, but you don't know that's when you move the mouse over it. Um, and there's nothing to hint at what actually happens when you were to click on it. So um yeah a bit of a ux and also design for par uh this next one is incredible um and it's incredible because this is completely the legit uh yale school of art website that like this is not just some like someone has made as a bit of a spoof like look at that you don't you can't get dot edu domain names as a spoof right you've got to apply uh this is their website the worst thing about it apart from like all of the text, um, you see this like black on yellow with no, no padding, no spacing, it's horrible to look at. If I go to, so there's navigation here. Uh, let's have a look in Exhibit. I can just like browse around. The website then completely changes, like it's both in layout and, and background. Some things uh, scrollable, other things aren't. Um, video backgrounds that are tiled, I don't know what's going on there. Just every page is different. Random memes that are, I don't understand. It's just really unpleasant. And then the black text on a, a faded yellow to white uh, thing that's scrollable. So you get sc uh, scroll traps. That's what they're called, where you basically, uh, I'm scrolling there. And then when I hit the bottom, then I start scrolling the whole page. That's not really good either. Um, it's a bit of a mess. Um, and then this one, a uh, local hero for me in Newcastle, she's based in Gateshead, I think. Uh, if you Google like um, list of worst user interfaces or worst websites, that kind of thing, this site is always, always in the list. Um, if this was a business studies lecture, I'd actually maybe put this in the good thing. It's one of those things that's so bad that it gets a lot of attention, which actually drives a lot of traffic to her site. So as a, as a business idea, yeah, it's a bit weird, but um, it like she can probably point to the statistics on uh, Google Analytics to show how much traffic she gets. 
I would argue that most people are probably like me that are coming to sort of look at this site and look how horrible it is. But it's just impossible to find anything. Like it, th there's navigation here, there's navigation here. All of this is clickable. All of this is navigation. Um, one of the things she has mercifully changed, the last time I uh, looked at this site about a year or more ago, there was auto playing music of uh, Ling Valentine singing karaoke. Um, that you, as soon as you went on the site, it started playing. It was horrible. I think you can probably play it. You get to the bottom of all these cars, but because of this uh, navigation isn't condensed, like you would just have, if you're looking at particular cars, you wouldn't list all of the sub, um, the, all of the models. You just list the manufacturers and then go into a model. Um, because she's listed everything, you get to the end of this bit, uh, yeah, trust me, uh, but it just keeps going. The page keeps going, all this white space, and that's caused because this navigation list is just absolutely huge. Um, all you're trying to read all of this stuff. The font size is too small, all while being visually bombarded by the two sidebar bits that are just like utterly insane. Um, so yeah, that's links cards. All of I'll um, be sharing my slides so you'll be able to go back and look at all of these sites to get some inspiration. But um, basically, the the reason I'm showing you all of those things is you can see what happens when things are done badly, but also when things are done well, it's about learning from both aspects of, of the good and the bad. Um, so finally, sort of five points I want you to take away. Um, use the principles from the government to, to frame your work and frame your thinking before you start. Um, understand the, the different powers of the different mediums, be that the color, the spacing, font, the layout, all that kind of stuff. Um, use tools to help you plan and design so like i said start on paper but then move to one of these wireframing tools or like the prototype tools because they'll massively help you um don't be afraid to copy from other people um it's like taking inspiration obviously give credit where credit's due if you've not um really altered something um but it's one thing to to copy it's another thing to be inspired by something um and finally i'd say that all design is it, an exercise in restraint. It's knowing all of these tools, knowing all of these little um, tips, but knowing uh, not just when to use them, but when to use them sparingly. Like you could make your entire website purple if you wanted to, but the best way of using a, a strong color like purple is to mainly have your website to be uh, white and black and gray with um, a little bit of purple spread throughout. If you make the whole thing purple, it'd be horrible. Um, so it's about knowing these things, but not overdoing it, um, which is the real fine art that you can't really teach. You've just got to get some experience. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's the end of my talk and I'm right on time. So uh, we've probably got a few minutes for some questions if anyone has any. Um, but I will stop my screen share now.